This is the day the Lord has made. Please stand for the processional as we begin our lay witness evening, as our laity will process, and we have come to celebrate the Lord. another day that the Lord has made and he is blessing us we give all honor and glory to our Savior for blessing us we will confirm the decree we made it we made it God was our healer. God was our comforter. God gave us peace. God was our protector. God was our provider. God brought us through this and that he brought us through this and that we made it we made it and God will continue to give what we need to make it we praise and we worship our God and let us never forget that we are a light for Christ because, because our Savior want our light to shine for him. So God, we are thankful, we are grateful, we made it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Because the house of our Lord, our God, I will seek thy good. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Blessed are those that dwell in thy house, Lord. I have loved thy habitation, the place where thy honor dwelleth. For the, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let, let all the earth keep silence before him. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Together, a new song. Forgive the marvelous things. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth sing praises. That's what we shall do. The hymn of praise, Layman Hymns. Layman, now hath thus assembled. In thy blessed name, O God, guide us in thy true endeavor, light the pathway that we trod. Give us strength to ever labor for thy cause. Give us strength to ever labor for thy cause. Without further lining, let us lift up this layman hymn of the church. Like 
let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, God, just thanking you, God, for this day, God, our opening day, God. Thanking you for being with us on this day, God. Thanking you, God, for your presence. Thanking you, God, for coming into this house, your house, and settling here with us today. So, God, we ask right now, God, that you, that we welcome you back here, God, with us tonight. God, we ask right now that you settle here, God. God, we ask that you remove anything, God, that is not of you, God. Whatever it is that we left at the door, God, we ask that you leave it there, God. We ask that you decrease us, God, because we need more of you right now, God. We ask right now that you touch the preacher of the hour, God, my first lady of Bethel Providence, God. Touch her from the top of her head, God, from the bottom of her feet, God. God, we know that she was with you in preparing this word on today. And we know, God, that you are with her now as she delivers the word to us. And God, we ask that if any of us right now are looking for a word, God, that you remove that thought, God. Because we are not here to look for a word, God. We are here to hear your word, God. So we just ask again, God, that you remove anything out of the way, God, that's going to get in the way of us hearing you. And that you have your way right now all throughout this sanctuary. God, we thank you. We love you. We will forever praise your name. And this is our prayer on tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.
Verses 6, Waymaker. Hmm. Be strong and courageous. That's fitting, huh? Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. This is. NIV Bible, 1 Corinthians, 9th chapter, 22b. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might some. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. to Bishop Julius Harrison McAllister, Sr., Presiding Prelate. Mother Joan Marla McAllister, Episcopal Supervisor. Reverend Jocelyn K. Hart Lovelace, Host, Presiding Elder. To Brother Eddie Lovelace, 
consultant and someone called him the other day first gentleman. To the fabulous, hardworking, spirit-filled, harmonious six host pastors and churches. Fabulous, spirit-filled, hardworking, harmonious six. To Mr. Matikane. Makiti, our connectional lay president. Ms. Patricia Wright, connectional lay director of lay activities. Mrs. Cheryl Hammond Hopewell, first district, distinguished first district lay president. First district. Director of Lay Activities. Our own Ms. Linda Gant, New England, New England Conference President. Ms. Nicole Nikki Ayers, New England. Conference Director of Lay Activities. Amen. To all visiting elders, all visiting clergy, all visiting lay officers, to the laity, to family and friends, to visiting family and friends, to the entire African Methodist Episcopal Church family. If I miss your name, he knows your name. The established I'm a soldier on the battlefield, and I'm fighting, fighting for the Lord. I promised him that I would serve until I die. I'm fighting, fighting for the Lord. It's good and dirty. I've had heartaches and pain, sunshine and rain, but I'm fighting, fighting for the Lord. If I hold.
I'm on the battlefield. I'm on the battlefield, fighting for the Lord. Won't give up now. I'm on the battlefield, fighting for the Lord. I've come too far. I'm on the battlefield, fighting for the Lord. I can't look back.
are certainly on the battlefield for our Lord this evening. Let us stand from all that dwell below the skies. Let the Creator's praise arise. From all that dwells before the sky, let the Creator's praise arise, and the Redeemer's name be sung for every land again. Lead us. Our lay litany for this evening. Almighty God, creator, sustainer, controller, and owner of all people and all things, we rejoice that amid our never-ending expressions of fear, care, anxiety, and concern, our ever-mounting vain desires and requests, and the wearisome struggles of this earthly life so often we complain about, that you have seen fit to afford us another chance. Abundant and for your grace and mercy, which are both unceasing. For, for the preservation of life, for health and strength, for natural resources, food, clothing, air to breathe, water to drink, earth to inhabit, the blessings of family and friends, for people to love us and for all those positive influences that you have placed all around us. We thank you for your goodness and abundance and your grace and mercy, which are both unceasing. For the African Methodist Episcopal Church, this haven of Christian growth and development, this institution of learning and Christian nurture, and for the opportunities for reflection, for retrospection, for repentance, for change. We thank you for your goodness and abundance, and for your grace and mercy, which are both unceasing. For the lay organization, members whom you have selected, have set apart, have prepared, have challenged, and have divinely enabled to be the leaders and teachers in your church. For the gift of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, whom you sent as a living example for us, who died on Calvary's cross for our sake, and who rose again. We thank you for your goodness and abundance, and your grace and mercy, which are both unceasing. Please bow your head for the glory of God. Good evening. I have the wonderful task to introduce our bishop. Bishop Julius Harrison McAllister Sr., a native of Darlington, South Carolina, a proud son of the late Reverend Joseph and Mrs. Gladys Marks McAllister, a graduate of Mayo High School in the year of 1968, received an associate's degree from Essex, Essex County Dean College in New Jersey, a Bachelor of Arts degree from Morris Brown College, and a Master of Divinity from the great school Turner Theological Seminary of the ITC in Atlanta, Georgia. He was licensed to preach in 1972 at Allen Chapel Amy Church in Omaha, Nebraska, which is, I want to say it's in the 5th Episcopal District. 
um, he came back to New Jersey where he was an associate minister at Israel Memorial AME Church. The Lord placed it on his heart to um, find a good thing. A good thing by way of Elizabeth, New Jersey, who he has been joined to the hip for 51 years of wonderful marriage. Mother Joan Marla McAllister. They're the proud parents of three children and five grandchildren. For the, for the 30 years of his life, he has enjoyed pastoring at three wonderful churches in South Carolina. Those churches have given him a lot of joy. He gets a lot of joy out to the good people there. Round time at his last church, Mount Zion Amy Church, the Lord told him it's time to go higher. Where he answered the call to run for the Episcopacy. By the summer of 2008 in St. Louis, Missouri, the wonderful people of the AME Church found in that robbery to elect them the 129th elected and consecrated bishop of our church. For his first, after his elect, election, his first appointment was in the 12th Episcopal District, which comprised of Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Tanzania. With, through financial assistance, he spearheaded the construction of 10 churches, 17 residential homes, and Kauranga, Maui, that had been destroyed by several earthquakes in December of 20, 2009. At the 49th quadrennial session of the General Conference, he was assigned to the 8th Episcopal District, that comprised of Mississippi and Louisiana, where he did wonderful, great work for eight years, leading the district and renovating the campus of Bonner Campbell School of Religion. He also assisted Union Bethel AME Church in New Orleans, Louisiana, in refinancing his mortgage at a much lower rate. He has a heart for the NAACP and a heart for religious, civic, and community activism. Our bishop has four scriptures that he loves so much. Psalms 27, one, Psalms 27, 14, Jeremiah 3, 15, and Jeremiah 4, 6. I would like to touch on two of them if I can. Psalms 27, 1 states, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. For whom shall I be afraid? This shows that God is the omnipoint creator of Bishop McAllister. All Bishop's strength comes from him. Psalms 27, 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. This shows that Bishop waits on God who brings him strength in all areas of life. And if I could touch on one last scripture. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Psalms 37, 23. Bishop's steps are ordered by the Lord. He walks in step. He walks in step with God. He is a good man, so God blesses him. He is the op the object of God's divine favor and under the care of God who removes any hindrance out of his way. Let's all stand. Without further ado, let's welcome my bishop, the right reverend, the 129th consecutive bishop, Julius Harrison McAllister C.
to the established protocol to all of you my brothers and my sisters and in Christ Jesus again it is my my pleasure and privilege to, to, to stand before you and to present uh, the preacher for this um, lay witness worship experience. Our preacher is Sister Teresa Jenkins, who is a <coughs> native of uh, Flint, Michigan. Uh, she is a, a graduate of Wilberforce University, yeah, where she received a Bachelor's of Arts degree in uh, sociology. She also received a, a master's degree in public administration. Currently, she is uh, enrolled at Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, uh, California, where she is pursuing a, mas a master degree in Christian counseling. She is employed with the Connecticut, Connecticut uh, Department of Children and Families as a social work uh, supervisor. Sister Dinkins was, uh, was, she accepted her call to preach in 2017 and was uh, licensed to preach uh, in 2018. By that uh, presiding elder, what's her name? Presiding, the presiding elder, Jocelyn Art uh, Lovelace. Sister Jenkins serves uh, alongside her husband, the Reverend Howard uh, Jenkins uh, Jr., the pastor of Bethel, African Methodist Episcopal Church in Providence, Rhode Island, where she is a, uh, a class leader teaches adult uh, church school and uh, she serves as the second vice president of the first Episcopal District Women's Missionary Society. I asked and I solicit in her behalf your prayers. Pray much for her as she comes to to say a word for for the Lord. And after hearing all of this uh, this great singing, uh, spirited singing, and this uh, Holy Ghost filled anointed choir and musicians and all of these wonderful uh, God-fearing liturgists. Uh, I know you're ready to, help, to hear from, from heaven. So don't sit in the seat of judgment. But you know, we used to say when I was growing up, we said to be, we, we believe in the golden rule. I'm trying to remember now, what is the golden rule? It says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is her moment now to preach. Yours will come later. Do unto her as you would want others to do 
unto you. Pray much for her as she comes to say a word for the Lord. You pray. I have a sneaking suspicion she will preach. And even if you don't say anything, she's still going to preach.
heavens are open, His Spirit is flowing, whatever you need, whatever you need, the heavens are open, His Spirit is flowing, whatever you need, whatever you need, the heavens are open. tonight. Are you ready? I'm here to tell you that there is a blessing in this room tonight. Are you ready? Because the God that I serve already told us this morning that he has invested in us. So we are already blessed. Amen. Praise the Lord. I give honor to God. And as I thought about my salutations and greetings, I first said I want to thank God because two years to the day, I was on my sick bed with COVID. Sick. I was sick. And God saw me through. And I'm standing before you because he invested in me. And this is a gift. And so I give honor to Bishop McAllister for allowing me to stand here as a licentiate. God invested in me, and I am humbled 
And I even questioned Sister Gant when she called me, are you sure that you were talking about me or Pastor Jenkins? But I thank you for saying yes. And Mother McAllister, thank you for your sweet spirit. To my presiding elder who was there when I preached my trial sermon, you and Brother Ed, I will forever love you guys for supporting my family. To our church family, and oh, I'm sorry to protocol. I uh, no protocol has already been established, but to Sister Masoror, God bless you. Brother Ed, God bless you. To Sister Gant, God bless you. But I have to say to my family and to my mom, who I'm sure is watching from Louisville, Kentucky, all that I am is because of my mother. My mother is a servant Christian woman. I've never seen her do anything wrong. I've always seen her read her Bible and pray and help everybody in the whole entire world. And at 89, if I called her today and said, Mom, I need you to come here, she would be on a plane in the morning or on the Greyhound bus coming to take care of us. But I can't go on without honoring my children who surprised me. I did not know they were coming. I kind of forgot that they were but to my son and his wife and my daughter Morgan and my absolutely, and everybody know that them three are our pride and joy. Them three grandchildren right there, that's why we go to work. Well, that's why I go to work every day, Pastor Jenkins. <laughs> but anyhow, and then last but not least, Pastor Jenkins, who said yes when they asked if I could free teach, because he is my pastor, and I honor and respect that that he's my pastor and I'll serve unto him. So thank you, Pastor Jenkins, for your love and your support. All right, amen, amen. Let us pray. Dear merciful and everlasting God, we say thank you. We thank you for this opportunity, God, to come before you. For sometimes we are not even worthy, God, to speak a word, but God, you saw fit today. And so we ask right now to use me for your glory and let your word do the work. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we heard the uh, scripture earlier, but I'll read it for your, re your hearing in the Old Testament of uh, Deuteronomy, the 31st chapter, verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified or afraid. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And the New Testament scripture is found in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, and verse 22. And I'm going to read verse 23 also. To the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I may be every possible means to some. Now I do all this because of the gospel so I may become a partner in its benefits. Bless the Lord. Amen. 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 And so the, the theme for tonight was empowering the pew, rethinking church in the changing world. And so I added a little tag to that, that uh, empowering the pew, rethinking the church in the changing world. So I've decided to add a word witness because this is lay witness night. All right. So witness is added to this theme, which says empowering the pew to be witnesses in the world. Amen? Amen? The word witness is described as one who testifies in a cause or before a judicial tribunal or one being asked to testify to something that has taken place. This is a witness. Now, for the purpose of tonight's message, I'm referring to a witness being someone who declares a belief in God and then testifies to what he has done in our lives. So in essence, the pew is empowered to become witnesses to the world by declaring what God can do, what God has done, and what God will do. In Deuteronomy, Joshua was empowered to remain encouraged because he witnessed what God had done when he delivered the children of Israel into the promised land. Another witness was Apostle Paul, who could testify how his life was transformed from being a persecutor of Christians 
to one who became a great missionary. It is our witness that is going to impact how we rethink church in a changing world. The 2016 edition of the AME Discipline state in section one of the Episcopal Salutation that the social witness and ministry of AME believers around the world continues as the direct response to the, pre to the presence and direction of the Holy Spirit. The introduction goes on to state that as African Methodists, we have a primary task to invite people into relationships with God through Jesus Christ. We also equip believers to render service as an expression of life in Christ. Inspired ministry, it goes on to say, fulfills the mission of Christ. That is, look, it was Joshua who oversaw the new generation of Israelites who were on the verge of entering the land God had promised to their ancestors. Now, the previous generation, they didn't make it because they failed to follow the, uh, uh, the plans of God. It was because of their disobedience and refusal to believe in the, di the divine word of God. It was the power of God resting on Joshua when he was publicly commissioned as God's choice for Moses' successor. Joshua was God's man whom God filled with the spirit of wisdom. The lesson of Joshua that connects us to our New Testament is this. God is faithful to keep his word, and we are to participate in his kingdom work through our obedience to him. Joshua refused to succumb to the pressures around him, and he challenged God's people to do the same. My brothers and my sisters, to empower the pew, we must declare like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua understood his assignment as he led the new generation of Israelites who were aged 19 years and younger into the promised land. This new generation was given an opportunity to demonstrate their, their obedience to God by refusing to take on the behaviors of their elders. We must become like the Joshua generation if we want to empower the pew. It is some stuff, it is some stuff we just need to leave behind. Lamont Gibson told us just burn it up. We need to leave it behind and jump on a train that is moving forward. Take, for example, the ministry that Reverend Caden Nurse and his wife, Dr. Christina Nurse, this new generation about urban wealth. Now, urban wealth, we're talking about raising a generation who understands money. This is how we empower the pew. We teach the basic principles of how to steward your money. I think that teaching generational wealth, builds tech, building techniques, is a way to empower the pew so that we can all learn how to become good stewards over what God has blessed us with. Amen? So as we continue this journey of empowering the pew to rethink church in the changing world, Apostle Paul is reminding us that we offer our service to the Lord by participating in kingdom work through obedience to God. Paul states in his letter to the church of Corinth that we are free from the demands and the expectations of everyone Apparently become servants to all. And guess why? So that we can re reach a wide range of people. It's us that need to hear the word of God. He is telling us that our assignment is not to take on the life of others because we are image bearers of Jesus Christ, but we are to come alongside them and listen so that we can understand life from their point of view. Paul writes, I have become about every sort of servant there is in my attempt to lead those I meet into a god saved
image bearers of Jesus Christ is to one, connect with others with an open heart. Two, disciple others with a willing hand. And three, reconcile with willing spirits. Because this is how we can empower the pews to rethink church in a changing world. When we, when we operate in this mindset, we can see God in the outside world as a place to garden souls. We are admonished to approach these souls with a sense of sacredness because people are profoundly complex. They're beautiful and broken. They're productive and paralyzed. They're fruitful and foolish, all at the same time. However, if we want to empower the pew, we must extend an economy of grace to those in Can we connect with an open heart to those who are unlike us? Apostle Paul had the uncanny ability to connect with various audiences, and I ask today, are we really ready to connect to, the, uh, to others with an open heart? Church, we have work to do. And it's not going to be easy. But remember in John, what the, do, the scripture said, you got to be strong and courageous. Don't let the world intimidate you. Because God said, I will be with you. But just like Moses reminded Joshua to remain strong and courageous, we too must remain strong and courageous if we are serious about connecting to people with an open heart in a changing world. No matter how we do church or plan future outreach activities, we must incorporate the message in all that we do. We can no longer remain content on how things were if we were if we are to be authentically and serve this present age. We can no longer push forward our judgmental ways, our traditional religiosity or counterfeit religion as an act of holiness and righteousness because these behaviors have weakened our witness in the world. You see, metaphorically speaking, Jesus spent a lot of time painting the vision for the church of the future. We are the church of the future. He talked about his relationship with the church the ethics of the church, and the ways the church should engage with those who are hard to love. We got to love the people with prickly uh, personalities. I wonder sometimes if we are the church that Jesus, uh, Jesus envisioned us to be. Or are we the church of the future that Jesus taught? Or are we living out his dreams and revelations? Or are we carrying the same torch the disciples carry? How was it that the early Christian church multiplied by the thousands in a short period of time? How was it that Richard Allen was able to grow the AME church in such a significant and profound way that allows us to worship and serve as a connectional body in this present age? Well, let me tell you how. Their eyes were fixed on Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, there are no quick fixes on how we're going to rethink church in a changing world. However, repentance needs to take place in the church. Because repentance needs to over, uh, we need to repent over our shallow spiritual formation practices and dismissive attitudes towards those who are not like us. These are the prerequisites if we want to reclaim those whom we've pushed out, pushed over, or left out. Repent for our sins because the body of Christ has fallen short of the glory of God. Tara Beth Leach writes in her book, The Radiant Church, that the vision of the church becomes radiant through repentance, vibrant through rigorous dis discipling, and transforming through reconciliation. My brothers and sisters, there are things that we, and I'm talking about the collective we, the body of Christ must repent from if we really want to empower the pew. We got to rethink church a different way. First, we must repent from not seeing people as God sees them. God is our sacred judge. Not, we don't judge each other, or we should not judge each other. God is our sacred judge. 
and we do not determine who becomes a part of the body of Christ. It is God's will that all will come to know him as Lord and Savior. Picture this. The Radiant Church is like a jigsaw puzzle. Each piece is different. But when connected to an adjoining piece, it helps create a wonderful masterpiece. Therefore, when we allow ourselves to connect to one another, we become the radiant community that God desires by discipling and restoring the credibility of our witness. Empowering the pew in a changing world also requires that we disciple with working hands. What I mean by discipling with working hands is this. We are to invite people to follow Jesus into a new community. This new community I'm referring to is one that creates corporate change, social change that leads others to love Jesus with heart, soul, and mind. Discipling with working hands will require us to practice civic engagement by putting our faith into action because when we walk with the Lord, we leave behind the sweet Allows us to connect with an open heart, disciple with working hands, and reconcile with willing spirits. I believe that Reverend Mariama White Hammond, the pastor of New Roots AME Church, is on the cutting edge of creating a radiant church community. Reverend Mariama White Hammond recognizes the importance of having a diverse the case of those who cannot speak for themselves. You see, we are God's earthly vessel to usher in a spirit of hope and healing into the lives of those who are broken. I once heard that broken things become blessed things if we let God do the mending. We have a collective responsibility to do what God has called us to do. God is calling for a specific and special mission because he has a strategic plan to win back what belongs to him. God is calling for us to see through the pain of the wounded and the brokenhearted by lifting them up instead of shaming and tearing them down. We have an obligation as we rethink church in a changing world because real ministry begins in the heart of God. And it is his relentless determination to get back the world that he has lost because of we are we are a fallen world because of Adam. Amen. Amen. God is determined to have the last word. It is his word that will enable us to make connections that will spread through our witness. Bishop Desmond Tutu. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. <laughs> Clergy and lay, it is incumbent upon us to reach the wandering and the uninterested and extend ourselves to become the Jesus people in the world. No one should have to question if we Jesus people. We do this by coming alongside them and activating what I will call spiritual flossing, which simply means removing the crumbs that is causing decay in our lives that is preventing us from finding out why people are falling in the river. Spiritual flossing allows us to help others by telling our stories of how we have been rescued from the river. 
everyone has a story to tell. So if you've ever been if you've ever been delivered from an addiction, then you have a story to tell. And if you've been saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what? You got a story to tell. We need to tell our story. Those who have fallen into the river can can those who have fallen into the river can hear about the man who saved us can also save them from drowning by offering them an eternal life jacket, and his name is Jesus. Aren't you glad you know a man named Jesus? A man who heals, a man who saves, a man who delivers. Well, if, it ha if he did it for them, if he did it for us, guess what? He can do it for them. We cannot keep the witness to ourselves. And finally, for us to empower the pew to rethink church in a changing world, we must reconcile with a willing spirit. It is time for us to start leading and serving from a posture of reconciliation as life is messy. The world in which we live in is a broken place, and we cannot avoid the disappointments and difficulties of human life and human frailty, but there is a clarion call for us to rebuild relationships with one another because change is necessary if we are to rethink church in a changing world. My brothers and sisters, it is, it is incum it's an indictment, I'm saying, I'm sorry, on the church that know that the gospel includes reconciliation across racial, gender, ethnic, social, and cultural barriers. Church, God has important work for us to do for him, but we must do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, we must operate in God's timing if we want to be truly effective in empowering the pew. We cannot run ahead of God. Waiting is a part of the plan. We are still in a waiting pattern, awaiting the great move of God. We are in this waiting pattern, I believe, because there is some reconciliation that still needs to take place. You see, God's message has not reached its final destination. Because if we still have family members, people we work with, or people in the community that have not heard the good news of Jesus Christ, there is still work for us to do. In the book of Ephesians, the first chapter, and verse 22, it tells us that the Jews and the Gentiles are brought together and Christ as one people. For those who trust in Jesus, the distinction between Jew and Gentile is abolished, abolished by his sacrificial death. So no hindrance remains for reuniting all humanity as the people of God. We are called to serve together in unity and live changed and courageous lives as we rethink church in a changing world. If you have not noticed, Communities all over the world are becoming increasingly diverse. We must be bold in ministering to those of different cultures and ethnicities as well as our own. Did not Jesus tell his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation? Church, it's time to get back to the basics of spreading the good news to everyone. We cannot keep this to ourselves because it is in his presence where we find the fullness of joy. So be courageous and do not be afraid. God is with us as we empower the pew to rethink church in a changing world by connecting with an open heart, discipling with working hands, and reconciling with willing spirits. And as I close with this quote from the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he said, if the church does not capture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. Let the church say amen.
Let us stand on our feet this evening. Can we give the Lord another hand clap of praise for that powerful message from Sister Jenkins on this evening? It is indeed our, our witness, our testimony, our ability to reconcile with one another that will grow our churches, that will cause others to want to come and be a part of Jesus Christ. Sister Jenkins, God bless you and thank you for an empowering message on this evening. But we cannot assume that everyone here tonight knows about this Jesus she spoke of. We cannot assume that everyone listening in or watching on Zoom is connected to Christ. And so we take this moment this evening to offer Jesus Christ to you. If you're here today without the Lord Jesus in your life, the doors of the church, the doors of our hearts, the doors are open and we extend an invitation to you to come. As musicians lead us in appropriate music at this time, we say, won't you come? Whosoever will, let them come. Secondly, if you're here this evening and you're without a church home, then now is also a good time to come. This nation. So if you're in the Zoom and feeling that compulsion, type it into the chat and we will be in touch with you. If you're here, come on down and give your heart and your hand to the Lord and begin a new life in Jesus Christ. Good evening, everyone. I'm so grateful for a very thought-provoking and very challenging message that has come from Licentia Teresa Jenkins. Come on, let's thank God for her. Amen. Licentia Jenkins, when you were delivering your message, a conversation came back to me from one of my relatives, and we were talking about virtual church. And she said, you know, since the church has been virtual, this was a moment of transparency. She said, you know, me and one of my church members, after church, we'd always get on the phone and we would talk about all that we had seen at church. She said we would say, ooh, did you see how short her dress was? She just kept talking. She said, ooh, you see that kind of purse she had? Ooh. She said, now that we're in virtual church, we don't have nothing to talk about. <laughs> and I just wondered, if that was something that was going to change whenever she went back to church, you know, it, it's so much that has to be taken away from us so that when we go back, we're not the same folks that left. Amen? Amen. I, I just thought I'd share how I remember that. Amen. Praise be unto God. This is time for offering. And uh, there are some members of the conference finance committee that are assigned to work tonight if you'll come forward but also there may be members of the conference lay organization finance committee if you would also come forward and help us lift up this offering this is a one offering one shot offering which would 